Thank you for joining our webinar on ERA's Energy Savings for Business program. We're glad you could join us so we could share this great opportunity with you. We're happy to announce that the program launched yesterday and we are now open to applications. Hopefully today's discussion will prepare to take full advantage of what the program is offering. My name is Luca Youngen. I'm the program manager of the Energy Savings for Business program for Emissions Reduction Alberta, or ERA. I'm here with Steve McDonald, ERA CEO, and Patrick McMahon, Contractor Support Manager with the Enerva and Summerhill team. Enerva and Summerhill helped design the program with ERA and will continue to support application intake and processing outreach and incentive application review. Steve, Patrick, and I will be trading off today as we talk about ERA's recently launched Energy Savings for Business program. And we'll all be here for the Q&A period along with Mark Hewitt, ERA Program Director, to answer any questions you may have. Before we get into the agenda, I'd like to start by going through a few housekeeping items just to make sure we get the most out of our time today. First of all, we're expecting several hundred attendees today, so everyone's microphone should be muted to avoid unintentional background noise. If you encounter technical challenges related to the webinar connection, please email Amanda at info at eralberta.ca and we'll try to help if we can. However, if you can't resolve your technical issues or if you need to leave early, we'll be posting a recording of this webinar on the Energy Savings for Business Program website. The recording will include both the presentation and the live Q&A with audio. For our agenda today, first, Steve will talk briefly about ERA and our mandate. Next, we'll provide an overview of the Energy Savings for Business Program. We'll also cover some key points about the program, including eligibility, project and measure types, incentive levels, and the application process, including a demonstration. We'll then make sure to leave enough time for a Q&A session. With that, it is my pleasure to turn things over to our CEO, Steve McDonald, who will get things started with an overview of ERA. Thank you everyone for joining us today. With over a thousand people attending the webinar, we are very pleased with the level of interest in this program. I want to briefly share some background about Emissions Reduction Alberta before Luca and Patrick dive into the details of the ESP program. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions while supporting the economy benefits everyone. And ERA's vision is anchored in the belief that our success is measured in both economic and environmental terms. Since 2009, ERA has invested the proceeds from the price on carbon paid by large final emitters. Our investments help innovators develop and demonstrate GHG reducing technologies at lower costs, improve competitiveness, and accelerate Alberta's transformation toward decarbonization. We identified opportunities that have the greatest commercial potential and deliver the maximum positive impact. Over the past decade, ERA has committed 616 million toward 186 projects worth a total of $4.5 billion. The projects are on track to deliver cumulative GHG reductions of nearly 35 million tons by 2030 and help create the equivalent of over 22,000 person year jobs by 2024 and contribute over 3 billion to Alberta's GDP. Our investments provide a clear line of sight from the price on carbon to the solutions needed to achieve continued economic and environmental success for Alberta. As you, can, as you can see on this slide, some of our biggest investments have been in the oil and gas industry, areas like partial upgrading and advanced recovery techniques. But our portfolio spans across sectors and timeframes. From utility scale wind and solar projects to promising new energy solution, we provide innovations in food farming and forestry that help improve the cost and carbon competitiveness of these sectors. And we are accelerating the de-risking and deployment of game changers like carbon capture and storage, hydrogen and artificial intelligence. Our past focus has been very much pre-commercial technologies technologies at the pilot demonstration or field testing stage. With the announcement last November of the Energy Savings for Business program, we have broadened our portfolio scope to include technologies that will help accelerate the adoption of commercially available technologies that help businesses cut costs and reduce emissions. 
These are extraordinary times and the ESB program is one piece of the province's response to help businesses navigate the challenges they are facing. It will provide much needed economic stimulus and help get people back to work. It will also demonstrate Alberta's continued commitment to being a leader in sustainable resource and energy use. You know, we've developed a program that will allow us to hit the ground running. It builds on the lessons learned from a variety of similar programs previously delivered in Alberta. And we know that support for small and medium sized businesses needs, needs to be streamlined and predictable in order to encourage participation. So this program offers a simplified application process, quicker turnaround times, expanded technology lists, and clear comprehensive information about eligibility. And most importantly, we will be in continuous learning mode as the program rolls out and look for opportunities to adapt and pivot the design as needed to ensure we are maximizing the desired outcomes. With that, I'll now hand it back to Luca and Patrick to share more details about the program. Thank you, Steve. Many people on the line today joined us for our eligible contractor registration webinars on January 26th and 27th. Some of this content will be familiar. Please stick with us until the end where we demonstrate the application process on the program portal. On November 2nd, 2020, we announced up to $55 million in funding from the provincial and federal governments to support cost saving and emissions reducing projects in Alberta. This funding is sourced from a combination of the Technology, Innovation and Emissions Reduction or TIER Fund in Alberta and the Federal Low Carbon Economy Leadership Fund. This program will be aimed at small and medium scale industrial and commercial facilities in the province. We are hoping to get these funds driving new investments as soon as possible. We designed the Energy Savings for Business program with four core purposes in mind. Energy Savings for Business will result in job creation and the preservation of jobs, more competitive Alberta businesses, an economic boost and support our province's economic recovery. And we're going to do all this while supporting technologies and projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions and address Alberta's longer term sustainability goals. Looking at the numbers, Alberta has over 160,000 small and medium sized enterprises and we're hoping to reach thousands with this program. As the ESV program rolls out, we're anticipating achieving the following results. Over 1,400 local jobs will be supported as participating projects rely on local contractors and a skilled workforce. This means direct jobs such as electricians, HVAC technicians, plumbing and heating experts, equipment distributors, lighting installers, product suppliers, engineers, and others. Provincial investment will be leveraged more than five times with other public and private investment, creating $300 million in GDP impact and economic activity. Over their lifetime, projects supported through the program are expected to reduce GHG emissions by 1.1 million tons of CO2 and to generate $183 million in energy savings. With all that said, you may be wondering how the ESB program will directly impact your business. On a per capita basis, Energy Savings for Business is currently the largest program of its kind in North America. Based on early engagement and surveys, we have heard from businesses that they are eager to participate in order to help reduce their utility bills. Learning from previous programs of similar scope, we have adapted the program to be more streamlined. We know time is money to Alberta businesses and are committed to fast turnaround times. For standard applications, this can be as quick as two days. The program has been designed to reflect the realities of the pandemic. Incentive payments will be made electronically and all program materials are available in a digital downloadable format that can easily be printed by contractors or participants. We have expanded the measures list to include categories that have not been offered previously, such as geothermal and compressed air. We have also made sure to include measures that are accessible to all businesses, like ceiling and wall insulation, refrigerated case covers, more efficient motors, lighting systems, and high efficiency windows. We'll have over 300 measures to offer in this program. The Energy Savings for Business program opened to applications yesterday, February 1st, for projects with eligible measures that incurred expenses on or after November 2nd, 2020. Projects that incurred expenses between November 2nd, 2020 and February 1st, 2021 must submit their applications no later than March 1st, 2021. Some relevant incentive limits to be aware of include a $250,000 limit per project and a $500,000 limit per parent company. There's also a minimum incentive amount of $1,000, which means that total project costs will need to be at least $2,000, depending on the measure type, in order to be eligible. The Energy Savings for Business program has been designed to be open to as many businesses as possible. 
Simply put, if you're a business and you own your building, you are likely eligible. In our previous webinars, we received quite a few specific questions on eligibility. Some requests for clarity came up around farm, faith-based organizations, and Indigenous-owned businesses. This program is designed to support a broad range of Alberta businesses and nonprofits. If you can answer yes to all of the following questions, you are eligible. Are you a business or a nonprofit in Alberta, excluding the ineligible facility types? Are you the owner of the facility? If you lease your facility, are you the authorized to complete uh, upgrades or retrofits? Is the facility used for commercial or industrial business primarily? Does it have a non-residential electricity account? Does your facility have an Alberta address? And is the facility an existing building? Has it been in operation for at least one year? Ineligible facility types include residences, government-owned facilities, publicly funded institutions, including if you receive 50% or more of your funding from a public authority, industrial businesses or facilities classified as large emitters or opted into the tier regulation, and new construction. Solar PV, geothermal, and CHP are exceptions to the new construction rule and are eligible. All measures have specific eligibility criteria, including but not limited to that the measure must be new, not associated with routine maintenance, and satisfy Canadian certification standards. In all cases, it is expected that work be carried out in accordance with relevant laws and regulations, including as this applies to regulated work or where permits may be required. On this slide, I will talk through an example measure, a variable frequency drive, and how the incentive is calculated. To start, the measure category generally describes the associated technology category for that measure. The measure type provides further description of the emissions reduction technology. The measure describes the specific end use or the size of the applied technology. The specific requirements list the important requirements and application notes for the measure. This list is not intended to be exhaustive and should be considered in conjunction with the participant terms and conditions document. Further, these requirements may not be the design or operating specification for the participant system. They are minimum eligibility requirements to ensure we are maximizing the cost effectiveness of program funds. For the incentive level in this example, if the motor nameplate is 10 horsepower, then the incentive value is simply 10 times the $125 per horsepower, or a $1,250 total incentive for the variable frequency drive. It's very important to know that the actual incentive payable is the lesser of the per unit incentive level multiplied by the motor size, or the maximum incentive cap times the measure price. For variable frequency drives, the incentive is a maximum 50% of eligible expenses. In other words, if eligible expenses total $2,000, then the maximum incentive would be capped at $1,000. Similarly, if the eligible expense total was $5,000, the maximum incentive cap would be greater than the per unit incentive level and the participant would receive the $1,250 in incentives. Throughout the measure list, you will find different incentive level types which are based on the characteristics of the measure. For example, the incentive level for insulation and windows is defined as dollars per square foot. For the example on this slide, the incentive for engineered nozzles is $25 per unit. Therefore, for a quarter inch nozzle, you'd get $25 in incentives. Also, remember that the minimum incentive per application is $1,000, so you would have to find other measures to include in your application to be eligible. Here's the final list of eligible measure categories. The categories listed under launch February 1st are currently available to be included in your applications with other measure categories coming soon. This is to ensure we offer a diverse range of measures providing businesses with as many opportunities as possible. The measures list provides a comprehensive guide for all measure types, requirements, and incentive levels and will be updated as we add new measure categories and measure types. Stay tuned for updates. We'll send notifications as we add more details. If you haven't signed up for updates on the website, please do so to ensure you have all the up-to-date information about ESB. In the next few slides, we'll cover each measure category and the incentive levels. First up is motors and drives. High energy costs can be the result of inefficient system design and motor operation. Equipment that is not properly matched to the requirements of the application tends to require more maintenance. Effective motor and drive system management can reduce operating costs, improve performance, and increase reliability. 
Compressed air is a new category previously not offered in Alberta at this scale. Air compressors are a vital part of many industry applications. They're used in fabricating metals, mining operations, ventilating tunnels, railroads, satellite component manufacturing, and a host of other ways. Of note is that modern air compressor technology has significantly improved over prior designs. This offers many opportunities for cost savings and efficiency. Often, the cost of the upgrade for the majority of measures can be recouped in one to four years. In addition to compressor upgrades, the program is offering incentives for equipment upgrades such as air receivers, air nozzles, zero loss drains, and even more efficient dryers. Refrigeration is a major consumer of energy for many grocery stores and refrigerated warehouses. By upgrading refrigeration equipment, business owners can significantly reduce their operating costs while reducing GHG emissions by implementing anti-sweat heater controls. Keep your inventory cold and your energy bills low with these measures. Lighting systems are important to Alberta businesses because they significantly reduce energy costs in industrial and commercial facilities. Lighting system options available for support through the program are limited to fixtures and systems with an emphasis on automation and controls. Building on past experience, we have eliminated lighting measures that have already proven their cost effectiveness in the marketplace. More stringent limits have also been applied to lighting measures to maximize program value. Lighting controls are also available through the program in order to help participants maximize energy savings, provide safety and security, and in some cases, satisfy building codes. Where energy efficiency measures help reduce energy needs, on-site generation can help offset the energy needs of the facility, significantly reducing utility costs. For on-site generation, ESB offers two technologies, solar PV and combined heat and power. Through Alberta's microgeneration regulation, connection, connecting these systems to the grid is a streamlined and straightforward process. Power generated will either go straight to the facility where it is needed, or it will be automatically exported for credit against the energy bills. CHP has previously been offered in custom programs, but never as part of a comprehensive prescriptive business program. Geothermal is an exciting new category that has never received incentives in an Alberta efficiency program previously. Geothermal takes advantage of renewable at a source of heat underground and upgrades it to useful temperatures for space heating. It offers a relatively unique opportunity to dramatically decrease emissions associated with space heating. Solar, CHP, and geothermal are all measure categories that have additional requirements and more comprehensive application processes due to the more complex nature of the projects. We recognize that it can be a challenge to complete these projects within six months, the standard window to submit project completion documents. So we may consider extensions on a case-by-case -case basis. The ERA website, eralberta.ca forward slash ESB is a great place to start when looking for additional information. The website will include program information, a library of past presentations, including this one, and a frequently asked questions document. We have recently revamped the website to include contractor-specific and resource pages. Today, you'll find the participant terms and conditions, measures list, and contractor code of conduct. In the coming weeks, we will add the program guidebook, which will be the companion of the terms and conditions, as well as the comprehensive FAQs collected from the various webinars. Application checklists for specific measures as well, and a program brochure you can provide to clients or within your organization. Program support is available through email, phone, and browser-based chat. I will now pass it to Patrick to discuss the application overview. Thank you, Luca. We'd like to take a few minutes to showcase the overall application process and then dive into the program portal to walk through the steps required to submit a complete and ultimately successful application. To establish sound expectations, we'd like to share the path to success and what activities are required from contractors and participants. Before we start, we encourage all stakeholders to review the available program resources and to reach out with questions for further clarity. As Luca mentioned, the program guidebook and application checklists will become available in the coming weeks and will be great references to support your engagement with the program. The first step is to register. This is required for both contractors and participants who are building owners or leaseholders. When a participant confirms an eligible project they wish to proceed with, they will initiate the application process through the Energy Savings for Business program portal and identify the eligible contractor they're working with. The participant will have the opportunity, at their discretion, to invite their contractor to contribute to the application by inputting various details of the project, 
or providing supporting financial or technical documents. On their own or with the help of their eligible contractor, the pre-approval application is completed. The participant will review and submit the pre-approval application, locking it for ERA review. If complete, we will accept the pre-approval. The system will notify the participant that the project has been pre-approved and the incentive funds will be reserved once the participant accepts the participant terms and conditions. We expect to be able to provide approval within two business days. At this point, the application will be unlocked and can be updated as the project moves forward to completion. The participant and contractor can then initiate the project, purchasing and installing eligible measures, with the exception of projects that have incurred eligible expenses from November 2, 2020, until February 1st, 2021, measure-specific expenses cannot be incurred until approval is received from ERA. Generally, the project must be completed within six months of receipt of pre-approval. We understand that combined heat and power, solar, and geothermal are more complex projects and applications, and we'll consider different, different timelines on those project types. Once the project is complete, the participant will re-engage to update and submit the post-project application to reflect the project as completed. When the application is submitted, it will again be locked for review and the participant will receive notice once approved. With the exception of geothermal, CHP, and solar applications, participants should expect to receive application approval or request for clarification within two business days. When the final application is approved, the participant will provide some banking information and should expect to receive payments within four to six weeks by electronic funds transfer. As you will see in the upcoming slides from the application portal, participants and contractors associated with a given project will be able to monitor the status of applications as they work their way to final approval. Let's get into the application submission experience to showcase the requirements of successful submissions and to highlight the usability of the platform. The process to submit an application begins on the participant portal homepage for the building owner or leaseholder and starts with a click of the Start Application button. This generates a prompt to confirm that you wish to start a new application. The participant must be the one to start the application process. You'll note that the pre-project submission and ultimately the post-project submission is a stepwise process. When initiating the incentive application, the participant will first identify the eligible contractor that they intend to work with to complete the project. At this point, the participant will decide if they wish to invite the selected contractor to be able to contribute to the pre-project application. If the contractor the applicant is planning on working with is not listed, they will need to be contacted and encouraged to apply for participation as soon as possible. Resources are available to contractors to make this process straightforward, including a registration screencast similar to this, support from the support team available by phone, email, and web chat, and more resources coming soon to serve contractors. Complete applications to become an eligible contractor will be approved within two business days. The submission of the application will ultimately be the responsible of the participant, including a review for accuracy and completeness. However, there are many obvious benefits of relying on the support of a contractor with specific expertise in the measures being installed that may make the overall submission experience more convenient. With the contractor selected and their support considered, the participant will click Save and Proceed. At this point, if the participant has chosen to share access to the application with their contractor, the contractor will be advised by email that a project is available for them to contribute to and it will be visible for them at the bottom of their contractor profile inside the program portal. Next, the project can be given an application or project name that makes sense to the participant and input the estimated start and completion dates. If the project will benefit from other forms of financial support, incentives, rebates, or subsidies, the program terms require disclosure of this information to ensure the project is not funded beyond the rebate caps, which may vary by measure from 25% to 50% of eligible expenses. Sources of additional funding support will need to be listed, separated by commas, and the sum of additional funds should be recorded. 
for the time being to accommodate projects where expenses were incurred between November 2nd, 2020 and February 1st, 2021. Expenses incurred to date will, be, will need to be inputted. Once the window for retroactive pre-approvals closes on March 1st, 2021, this will be removed as expenses are only to be incurred after pre-approval has been provided. When these fields are complete, click Save and Proceed. Next, the facility where the site or the project will take place uh, needs to be selected, or if not already defined, as is, as is in the case on the screen, it'll need to be created. In cases such as the one presented, the user completing the application, which could be the contractor or participant, will click Add Facility. They will then be prompted to input the details of the facility, including the opportunity to define a common name for the facility, record the address, select the type of facility from a list including office, industrial, warehouse, agricultural, recreation, multi-unit residential, among others, and select the utility, the electrical utility servicing the facility. If known, the approximate annual volume of natural gas the facility, facility uses will be collected. Finally, you'll be asked to confirm if the facility is leased or owned by the participant. Note that similar projects at different sites will require separate applications as only one site can be selected per application. With that information recorded, the user will click Save. They will return to the list of facilities and select the location where the project associated with the application is taking place. With the appropriate facility selected, click Save and Proceed. If you have already made it to this point, when you click Save and Proceed, you will have noticed a pop-up displayed that notes that the next step in the process will open soon, enabling you to proceed through the process of selecting your measures and uploading supporting documents. Right now, you can complete any of the prior steps as demonstrated, including registering as a contractor or participant, assigning a contractor, and identifying your facility or facilities. For those that take these steps, you'll be notified proactively when the next steps are available. When you are ready to enter measures, the layout will look very similar to the facilities layout. This portion of the application will be empty until measures are added. Multiple measures can be added to a single application for a single site. A participant might consider the suggestion to group applications by phases of a project around a common measure category in order to streamline review and accelerate approval. To start adding measures to the application, click Add Measure. You will then start working through a series of dropdowns to identify the measures being installed. The dropdowns are contingent on previous selections, and when a specific measure is ultimately selected, there will be a few unique data points relevant to the measure to be collected to complete the requirements for this particular measure type. Measure checklists will be released soon to provide specific clarity for contractors to understand requirements of each eligible measure or installation. For each measure, the quantity installed, equipment and material costs, labor costs, and design costs will also be inputted. All this information will be used to calculate the estimated incentive associated with the measure. When complete, the user will click Save. The measures will be added to the measure and project summary table. The process, as previously described, will be required for each measure to be added to the pre-project application. Participants may want to consider grouping measure types into one application. So for example, HVAC measures into one and compressed air into another. This will help expedite the approval process. When the measure and project summary is complete or otherwise represents the pre-project application as intended to be submitted for pre-approval, click Save and Proceed. The next step is to upload relevant documents, quotes, invoices, spec sheets, etc. Drag and drop files into the gray area or click to prompt the opportunity to add them from your mobile device. When the necessary documents have been uploaded to the project application, you'll have the opportunity to review the attachments, rename them to identify them more clearly, or remove them from the pre-project application. When the necessary documents have been added to the submission, click Save and Proceed 
to review the application and submit for pre-approval. On the final step in the submission process, the participant will have the opportunity and the obligation to review the pre-approval application prior to submitting for review. First is the facility where the measure or measures are being installed. The measures added through the selection form are summarized, including the total value of the incentives associated with the application and the documents submitted with the pre-approval application to support prompt review and confirmation. The project summary continues and identifies the eligible contractor selected by the participant, the project name the applicant defined, the estimated start and end dates along with any sources of funds and value of additional funding support, and the value of expenses incurred prior to application submission. Please note that expenses incurred prior to February 1st, but after November 2nd, 2020, must be submitted as a part of the pre-approval by March 1st, 2021. The participant will need to review the requirements for submission and attest that the information provided is true and accurate. This includes that eligibility requirements of the participant, the facility, and the intended measures set out in the terms and conditions are satisfied and confirms that the applicant has not received funds directly or indirectly as a result of the tier regulation, the repealed Climate Leadership Act, or programs of the Pan-Canadian Framework. Additional acknowledgements are required, which should be reviewed prior to submission of the application. Ultimately, these attestations and acknowledgements will need to be confirmed by the participant before the application can be submitted for review and funds pre-approval. When the application is submitted for review, it cannot be modified and the applicant can navigate back to their account page to review application status or submit another application for additional scope at the same facility or for eligible projects at another facility. You'll note the application reference number associated with the application is indicated, which will be the internal reference and may be worth noting. It is also easy to identify from within the user portal at any time. By clicking go to account page, Users will return to their account profile where they can scroll down to the application overview section to review the status of applications associated to the participant or in the case of the eligible contractor where their firm has been selected as associated with the project. The participant can also start another application from this section of their profile. The process to submit the project for incentive approval once it's been completed is effectively an updating of the unlocked and approved pre-approval submission we've just walked through. Again, this can be done with or without the engagement of an eligible contractor at the participant's discretion. The very same application will need to be updated to reflect the actual installation. Think model numbers and quantities if they might have changed from what was expected when the pre-approval application was submitted. Additional documents reflecting the actual project costs, commissioning, and other certifications or verifications will need to be attached to the post-project application before submitting for review and ultimately payment. If changes from the pre-approval submission to the post-approval submission change the eligible incentive by more than 10%, a change request will be required to be made by the participant. These will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Hopefully this walkthrough has been helpful to showcase the application process and at this time, I'll pass it back to Luca to kick off the Q&A session. Thanks, Patrick. As a reminder, we'll be posting the recording of the webinar on the Energy Savings for Business webpage listed above. You can also find the link to the portal on the webpage. We'll be sending a notice when the recording and the contractor FAQs are posted. If you're looking for more information or your question wasn't answered today, we're happy to chat. You can email us at support at esbprogram.ca or call our dedicated contact center at the number listed above. In the upcoming weeks, we'll be hosting measure-specific webinars to take you through the application process for different measures. We'll send an email when the dates and the topics are finalized following the publication of all measures in the Energy Savings for Business program. Okay, if you've made it this far, now's your opportunity to ask any questions of the program panel. Mark Huot, Program Director, has joined us, and Steve, Mark, Patrick, and I will answer your questions. 
If you haven't done so already, please type your questions into the questions section of the control panel, which is typically on the right-hand side of your screen. At this time, I would like to introduce my colleagues, Alison Mostowich, our outreach manager, who will moderate the question period, and Brittany Tran, our program analyst, who is behind the magic curtain of the webinar collecting the questions. Alison, what questions do we have so far? Thanks, Lucca, and thank you to everyone who has submitted questions so far. We have a lot of great questions, and we likely won't have time to get to them all today. If we don't get to your question, please submit it to support at esbprogram.ca, and we'll be happy to respond to you one-on-one. -on -one. Please also note that we'll be using your questions to inform our frequently asked document, which will be posted on the website closer to launch. The first question that we have is probably a great question for Steve. Um, we had someone ask about oversubscription. So if the program becomes oversubscribed, how would the government handle this? Thanks, Alison, and that, that is a great question. Uh, right now, what we have for certainty is the $55 million uh, total pool available. There's no indication that amount will be increased. So this very much is a first come, first served type of program. So for now, when the funding runs out, the program would end. Great, thanks so much, Steve. Um, the next question is probably a great question for Mark to answer. Um, when can the outstanding measures be expected? So I think we've got some information on our website that talks about measures that are, that are gonna be coming soon. Um, can you answer that, Mark? Absolutely. So um, as part of this program, we're trying to offer the widest range of measures and uh, give the most options to folks as possible. So there are some that are still in the works and are coming soon. We're hoping to get them out um, as soon as possible, but expect them to start rolling out next week and to uh, be out mostly over the next few weeks. So fairly soon. Um, the best thing to do is to stay tuned to the website or if you haven't already to sign up for notifications and we'll make sure to keep everyone in the loop. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, I'm gonna direct the next question to Patrick. Um, we had a, an eligible contractor webinar a little while ago, but we are still getting questions about how people can register as either an eligible contractor or a participant. So Patrick, would you mind addressing that? Yeah, I think if you navigate to the program page, you'll see that there's a login um, prompt and below that there's a link to indicate that you'd like to register for program participation. Um, so you can click that link and work through the application process there. I understand the webinar that we uh, we did at the end of January has been posted on the Missions Reduction Alberta website uh, and that includes a screencast of what the experience is like for registering as a contractor. So if you want to have a bit of a video guide to support you there uh, that resource is available on the uh, program resources page for energy saving for business on the Emission Reduction Alberta website. Great, thanks Patrick. Um, let's go to Luca now. Um, can in-house contractors purchase and install measures? Luca, would you address that question? Yeah, thanks Allison. It's a great question that's come up during our contractor webinars as well. Um, so simply put, um, if you have a third uh, party contractor on staff, we understand um, you might wanna use them to complete your project. So definitely um, they can install um, the, the measure that you've selected. However, the cost of the labor to install the measure would not be included. Um, as an eligible cost. So just the measure cost uh, would be eligible. And also we're asking that um, when the cost of the measure is submitted, just that we will ensure that it's a fair market value of that measure. Great, thank you, Luca. Um, and so just to follow up on that question, we do have some questions about which parts of the process need to be completed by the contractor versus the participant that may own or lease the facility. Patrick, did you want to take a stab at that one? Sure thing, awesome, thanks. Um, so the application always needs to be initiated by the participant who's the building owner or leaseholder, and then they can choose if they'd like to have their contractor support the application, and they'll do that at the first step of the application process. Um, 
many of the details after that until the final um, step in the application submission process will be eligible for or available for contributions from the eligible contractor. But again, the participant will initiate the application and can choose at their discretion to involve the contractor to support with the with completing the application forms. Great, thank you so much, Patrick. Um, so Luca, I think you had talked a little bit about this in one of your previous answers. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, the incentives for labor? Um, are we including labor in incentives for this program? Yes, so um, it's not an easy answer, but I'll try my best. So yes, labor is included as an eligible cost um, for the program. Um, so we just need to keep in mind that the incentives are based on the total project cost. So that is the cost of the measure plus the labor. And we do have some maximums um, set out um, for the measures uh, in the program. So generally speaking, they're 50%, um, but for lighting, solar, and CHP, they're a little bit lower at 25%. So that's the maximum of eligible expenses. So you just have to make sure that if you're including um, the cost of labor, that you're um, below that threshold um, before you submit. Great, thanks so much, Luca. Um, and I will just mention as well, if anybody needs more information on that, the participant terms and conditions are already on the website, so you can always go ahead and read those there or contact our contact center for more information. So the next question we have um, is about contractor registration. So we have somebody asking from a participant standpoint. So if a participant has started an application and they want to select a contractor, can they, sorry, can they select a contractor at a later date or does a contractor need to be selected before they can move forward in the application process? Patrick, would you want to address that one? Yeah, sure thing. So uh, it is uh, part of the first step process and required field to move past that stage. So it is uh, necessary that the participant can identify an eligible contractor uh, that they're working with um, to initiate the application process. Um, it is around a two-day uh, turnaround. We've had a swell of interest, as you might expect, but um, two days to approve eligible contractors, lots of information about that process and what's required, um, as I mentioned on, in the previous answer. Um, so if you have a contractor that you're working with that's not on the list at this time, please do encourage them to uh, register for program participation, and we'll work to approve their status as quickly as possible. Uh, so that you can initiate that um, incentive application. And maybe if I could just also quickly add uh, to Patrick's answer, um, if you throughout the process decide at some point that you do need to change your, your contractor or you would like to change your contractor, you can always reach out to us and we can uh, we can help you do that on your application form. Great, thank you. Uh, so this might be a great time to address this question, just as a follow-up to that. So Patrick, I'll let you go first on this one. Um, do the contractors have to be external or can they be internal as part of a larger organization? Um, yep, thanks for that. Um, so they can be internal. So if you're part of a large organization that has an internal technical team that would fulfill this work, um, that is um, totally permissible within the program. The business that employees that internal staff would also have to register not only as a customer or a participant but as a contractor as well to select their firm um, in the in the initiation of the application process it may be worth noting at this point that the list of eligible contractors will not be proactively listed on missions reduction alberta's website or the energy savings for business website it will only be visible um, through the application initiation process so um, you don't have to worry that your firm that doesn't do uh, installation work for in the kind of general public will be will be identified as as such but um, you are certainly welcome to use your own staff um, but you will have to register your firm as a uh, part eligible contractor as well Patrick that was going to be my next question about will we be publishing a list of eligible contractors so you're reading my mind um, okay, so let's go back to Luca. We have a question about um, energy assessments. So 
Will projects need to have a detailed energy assessment uh, for the buildings that they're going to retrofit? Luca, did you want to address that one? Yeah, thanks, Allison. Um, we received a few similar questions during our contractor webinars, so uh, glad to, to try to answer that one again. Um, so specifically for energy modeling costs, they are considered an eligible expense. Um, however, again, they need to be included uh, below the threshold um, as an eligible expense. So um, if you are including it, um, it also needs to be um, associated to a completed measure. So we're not uh, incentivizing studies um, on their own. They need to be as part of a completed uh, measure that has been submitted for incentive payment. This is Mark here. I'm just going to add to that. Um, to be clear, those are not required to participate in the program. So a, a big part of the reason we've selected this program approach is to make it very easy for especially small and medium-sized businesses to participate, um, to participate quickly and to get moving quickly as well. So the program really was structured to not require any upfront study. You will be required to know information like what the product is that you're installing, what the model numbers are. So depending on the level of complexity, you may wish to get a study in advance to help you select the technology, but um, our stream streamlined application uh, does not require that as a step. Thanks, Mark. That was a really great clarification. Okay, so we have some questions about um, having an eligible contractor as well as if there are multiple contractors. So, Luca, would you mind explaining if there are subcontractors as part of the application, how would that work in the application process? Yeah, another great question um, that came up during our contractor webinar. Um, so definitely we understand that uh, some contractors do employ subcontractors. Um, so what we're asking is that um, if the main contractor uh, registers uh, to complete a project um, and they have subs that are working, working under them, uh, we just want to make sure that the main uh, contractor is then responsible for the work uh, associated to those subcontractors. So it really depends on the situation, um, I guess how much work the subcontractor is going to be completing and how often if they're going to be working on multiple projects, for example. But generally speaking, it might make more sense for just the main contractor to sign up and then be responsible for the work of the subtrades. Great. Thanks so much, Luca. So let's talk about other funding sources. Um, Luca, I'll start with you, and then Mark, if you want to jump in, you're welcome to. Um, we know that there's some other efficiency pro programs going on right now. A really good example is the um, Building Energy Retrofit program in Edmonton. So can you talk a little bit about fund stacking and if people are eligible to participate in multiple programs, Luca? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so as you mentioned, um, participants in the ESP program are able to stack incentives with the BARA program in Edmonton. Um, so there are some um, limitations there. We we are not um, going to allow stacking above 50% of, of total, um, total costs. Um, and also just to go back to your um, funding from other sources um, question, just to uh, Make sure everyone understands. So, no funding from TIER, um, the Repealed Climate and Leadership Act, or Pan Canadian Framework programs can be stacked with funding from the ESB program. Great, thanks, Luca. Mark, did you have anything to add to that? No, I think that was a good answer. Um, as part of the application, it does ask you to indicate if you do have other funding sources. And if um, if you have any questions at all about a specific program, it's easiest just to ask because we understand you might not know if it's tier funded or from the previous carbon levy. Um, so we're happy to clarify that. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, Patrick, I'm going to direct this next question to you. Um, so we have some questions about the specification, specification sheets that you were mentioning. Can you talk a little bit about um, when the specification sheets can be expected, as well as what types of information will be available on them? Yeah, certainly we're anxious to get uh, as much valuable information to the key stakeholders as, as, as quickly as possible. I can't really be any more specific on the release of those as far as I'm aware right now. 
um, but they will be incredibly useful guides to uh, manage expectations at the outset around all of the measure categories, um, what will be required for measures, what documents will be required for support. Um, so we do expect them to be very valuable resources to uh, contractors especially um, to uh, ensure that uh, they're considering the program expectations while they're uh, setting expectations with their their customers and to showcase um, what specifically will be required for complete uh, submissions. So um, yeah, very valuable resources coming as, as promptly as possible, um, just with a general interest in supporting the market and trying to move at the speed of business. Yeah, and I, if I could maybe just add to that um, more from a participant perspective, um, as many of you have seen, we have the participant terms and conditions available on our website. Um, it is quite a long and detailed uh, document. Um, if you're looking at it for the first time, it's, it's you know 20 pages long and quite a bit of information in there. So we are in the background working on a, a guidebook to help explain um, some of the more, uh, I guess, complicated components of the program. For example, getting into the details of, um, you know, specific eligibility requirements. So we'll have nice examples in there um, for measure calculations, for incentives, um, for the application process, just to help folks uh, walk through uh, in a bit more detail. Great, thank you. Um, we're starting to get a couple clarifying questions on the stacking. So. Um, you had talked about uh, some of the different acts that stacking is allowable under. Um, so we just had a question specific to SEEP and PACE that MCCAC, or the Municipal Climate Change Action Centre, that they're offering. Is stacking allowed under those programs? So Luke, SEEP, this one? is, oh, oh sorry, here, I can take this one. Uh, SEEP is actually not an incentive program. It is a financing program. So participants will still be, um, financing the entire cost of the system and therefore could access CSB. Uh, at this time, commercial SIP is not yet available. So as it uh, approaches launch, we'll be happy to work with MCCAC to provide any further guidance there. But um, yeah, that, that program is a bit different, so it's not a stacking issue. Great, thanks so much, Mark. Uh, we had a clarifying question about um, in-house contractors and labor with in-house contractors. So if a participant is using an in-house contractor, is labor then an eligible expense? So yeah, I can try to clarify that. Um, so if a participant is using an in-house contractor, um, labor will not be an eligible expense um, for that measure. However, the full measure cost at fair market value will be an eligible expense. So you can still potentially, um, you know, depending on the type of product um, and model you install, you can still um, potentially get the full incentive value for that. Great, thanks Luca. Uh, we have a question in here about timelines. So Patrick, I might kick this over to you. Um, so we, the question is around the November 2nd, 2020, and then um, the February 1st start date. So I'm just wondering if you could go over those timelines again um, in terms of pre-approvals. Yeah, I'd happy to do my best, and maybe if Luke or Mark want to chime in and close some gaps here. But the program announcement was made on November 2nd, 2020, and so... Um, activity that was motivated by that announcement would be considered eligible for participation. So if expenses had been incurred since that date for products um, that are deemed eligible for participation now from the uh, measure list, um, those would be uh, eligible for an incentive application. It's very important um, kind of from a going forward look that um, the pre-approval application needs to be submitted before expenses are incurred going forward from February 1st, 2021, program launch date. Um, and then for those those expenses that were incurred between November 2nd, 2020 and February 1st, 2021, we, uh, we require that a pre-approval application be submitted not later than March 1st, 2021. So We'll give you a month to um, submit applications for retroactive work, and then, but going forward from effectively February 1st, 2021, we'd expect that applications be submitted prior to um, expenses being incurred. 
And maybe I don't know if Luke or Mark has any uh, clarifying points or. Yeah. No, I thought that was a great explanation. Um, maybe the only thing I'll add is I think the, the main benefit going forward um, after February 1st is that if you um, submit an application um, and for example it's middle of winter and your you know your boiler has an issue and you need to you need to get that addressed um, obviously you're taking a bit of risk because you're submitting an application and we haven't provided approval yet but if it's on our eligible measure list um, there's a good chance um, that you know you can move ahead with that and not have to wait to hear back from us you know a couple days even though it's a, a relatively quick turnaround time um, so that you can start uh, repairing your your equipment or getting it replaced Great, thank you. So we probably have time for one or two more questions. Um, I think this one is a, a really important question that we've had a couple of times. Um, so how many facilities can you have per application? And if you have multiple facilities, how would you deal with that? Patrick, did you wanna take that one? Yeah, sure thing. So it is uh, will be required that applications be site specific or facility specific. Um, so any, um, work that's being done on a, a specific site will need to be collected on an application individual like on its own um, you may choose to break out work at that site into different applications depending on the measure category or the contractor you might be working with uh, but I think from a global perspective it's important to highlight that applications will be required on a one-to-one -one basis with with a site um, and there is a, a incentive limit of $250,000 per site. If you are an organization with multiple sites, you, there's no effective limit on how many sites um, you can have associated with your profile, um, but recognize there is a $500,000 incentive limit per, for a parent company. Um, so yeah, every application, you can only have applications per site, uh, but as an organization, you have multiple sites and then um, a number of applications across a number of sites or a number of applications at an individual site. Thanks, Patrick. So just to clarify, each site would be one application or multiple applications. And are there, is there a limit to the number of applications that a company or a contractor can have? No, there'd be no limit, uh, only the uh, as it would reflect or as, as the the total applications as they would come into the incentive limit either for the site or for the parent company. Um, I'm not sure if there's other clarifying points from maybe Luke or Mark. Uh, yeah, I can Luke jump Mark, in. But... This is Mark here. We do have a minimum incentive requirement of $1,000. So obviously if you're breaking it into multiple pieces, you'll have to make sure that each individual application is above that amount. And as Patrick said, I mean, generally it's just easier for you to submit it together if it's one facility. Um, there's just a bit fewer paperwork. You don't have to do the same work multiple times. But that being said, if there's, uh, you know, for example, you're doing solar PV and an HVAC equipment, they might be with different contractors and have different timelines. That's a really good example of a time when you might want to split it into two so that they can proceed independently. Great, thank you so much. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions today. Um, we still do have questions in the queue, and I apologize if we weren't able to get to yours. If you still want those questions answered, you're welcome to email us, and I'm about to put the contact information up again. Um, if you have more questions, again, you're welcome to email us, call us, or chat with us. Um, we do have a chat function live on the website now. It's a little bit hard to find. There's a little blue box on the very bottom of the website, and there's also one on the portal, too. Um, so we put the contact up information up again in case you didn't quite capture it the first time around. I'm sure most of you have done so, but if not, we welcome you to visit the new ESB page. Um, the link to the portal is now live for contractor registration, participant registration, as well as to register your business. And you can also find all of the important documents that you'll require for the program, including the participant terms and conditions, the code of conduct, and the measures list, and more to come. So thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we hope to see you at the next webinar.